thank UCLA and Center of X, uh, not just for inviting me to participate, but for holding this community at such a critical time. Um, I do note, and I'm going to take out of here and let everybody know that even teachers sit in the back of the classroom instead of moving to the front. <laughs> y'all tell all of us when we're students to move to the front, but y'all are in the back. But I'm just pleased to see all of you on an early Saturday uh, and your commitment to addressing the critical issues that we collectively face in education as a result of the Trump administration. I'm inspired to see all of you here this morning. Um, so thank you, each and every one of you. I want to begin also with history as John did. Uh, I want to note that 2017, in June, is the 35th anniversary of a very important Supreme Court case, Plyler versus Doe, that I hope many of you are familiar with. Now I mention it not just because of its relevance to what you all will be addressing today in the conference, but also because, frankly, it's a Maldiv case and perhaps the case of which we are most proud throughout our now 49-year history. For those who are not familiar, Plyler versus Doe is a case that came out of Texas. So many of these cases then and now come out of Texas. <laughs> where the state of Texas had decided that it would not pay local school districts for educating undocumented students. Now the result was that school districts were permitted to charge tuition for K through 12 public school to undocumented immigrant students. Now that clearly, as you all know, meant that they would not attend school. They would not have the ability to pay the tuition and the result of following through on that permission by the state of Texas would mean thousands and thousands of kids not in school. It went to the Supreme Court and in a five to four decision, the Supreme Court decided that it is unlawful under our constitution to deny admission, to deny an education from kindergarten through 12th grade to any child regardless of his or her immigration status. Now I know that it was a five to four decision and you will hear that to the extent there's conversation in media and otherwise about this 35th anniversary. That suggests to some on the right that Plyler versus Doe is somehow in jeopardy because it was such a close decision. But I want you to know that all nine of the justices even the dissenters, including the most conservative justice at the time, William, William Rehnquist, who would soon become Chief Justice. But all nine of the justices joined an opinion, dissent or holding, that concluded that the Texas law was very bad policy. That it was not something that any of them would support as a matter of policy. Their only difference of opinion was about the constitutionality of what Texas had done. Now that is in marked contrast with today, where we have national leaders, certainly state leaders, who would question whether Plyler versus Doe should remain the law. But I want you also to understand that it is quite clearly, at this point, established constitutional law. Not only that, the Plyler principle of every child's right to an education regardless of immigration status, is now codified in federal statute. It is protected in state after state around the country. So when you hear these ambitions of taking Plyler back to the court with a hope of having it overturned, I want you to reassure yourselves and your students that that likelihood is extremely small. Plyler is well-established law. Its importance goes beyond just being allowed to enroll. As educators, you understand that. Schools do not exist to warehouse students, so Plyler does not establish a right to be warehoused. It establishes a right to an education. So it extends beyond simply being allowed to enroll. It means that every student, regardless of their immigration status, has a right to be educated. In the context of today, that means their education should not be disrupted by the presence of immigration authorities on campus. It means that is a constitutional principle overriding any federal, state, local, or other statute or ordinance. The right to an education means, under Plyler, a right to be educated 
without fear of the presence of immigration authorities on campus. It also means the right to be educated free of an anxiety or fears that would prevent you from receiving an education. Now in telling you this, I'm not telling you what the Supreme Court has written explicitly. I'm telling you what the fair reading of Plyler is. There is a constitutional right to go to school free of fear and anxiety that would prevent your being educated. That means we all have a constitutional obligation nationwide, not just to ensure the right to enroll, the right to attend daily, but also to ensure the right to be free of the fears and anxieties that are created by immigration enforcement, particularly present on campus, but also to have the fears and anxieties that might be occasioned by what's going on outside of the campus addressed by educators in school. That's a critical constitutional obligation that supports everything that all of you believe in today. So when you go back to your campuses, please understand, you go back with the mantle of the U.S. Constitution supporting your efforts to ensure that every student, regardless of immigration status or their parents' immigration status, has the right to be educated free of fear and anxiety. Now you all know why this is important. We face an unprecedented threat. As John has described, the Trump administration is different from anyone that we have seen in the last century. They have unleashed a level of fear and anxiety in communities, not just immigrant communities, but related communities across the country. They have unleashed that fear and anxiety through a campaign of rhetoric and overblown pronouncements in many cases that extend well beyond what the actual authority of President Trump or any other president or Secretary of Homeland Security may be. That is to say that in the first 95 days, we have not, with the notable exception of the Muslim ban, seen actual change in federal policy. That is, many of the things that have been threatened, including most ominously an expansion of expedited removal, which is the denial of due process to immigrants who have been in the country for what had been a short period of time, would under the threatened change would be a long period of time, but the denial of due process to those immigrants. They have said that they will make that change repeatedly, but have not yet taken any step to actually implement the change. The same is true, for example, of the threat to sanctuary cities. You may have read yesterday that letters were sent to nine jurisdictions. Those letters do nothing but ask for a certification that the jurisdictions are compliant with existing law. Other than that, the administration has done nothing to take money away from any sanctuary jurisdiction. This is important because this institutional threat is often overstated. Current law and those who actually understand the law, assuming they exist in the Trump administration, <laughs> realize that current law is not sufficient to threaten the funding of any currently enacted sanctuary policy across the country. They would have to change the law through Congress to seriously threaten any existing sanctuary policy. That is to say, they have overstated repeatedly what their authority is, banking on a view that their imperial pretensions would be adopted and believed by people across the country. It is important that we come back to that. Now the critical element of this ongoing policy of overstating the powers of the administration, of overblowing what can happen today, is simply to create fear and confusion, <coughs> unprecedented levels of fear and confusion 
in the immigrant community. I believe that's intentional. What we are seeing is a national attempt to implement what was called in the 2012 presidential election a campaign of self-deportation. What was named by Arizona in its infamous SB 1070 as attrition through enforcement. They are trying through rhetoric alone to create such a high level of anxiety that immigrants will withdraw from participation in society. And regrettably, we've seen some of that, I know and that they will choose voluntarily to leave the country. In a context of this kind of what my colleague has, I think, fairly characterized as psychological warfare, our response must be strong and specific to the threat. I think we have to ensure that every member of the immigrant community, commensurate with their age, understands and believes three things. First, we need to work together to ensure that everyone knows their rights. Now that's not easy, particularly in a context where the administration is consciously creating confusion. But we must do our best to ensure that everyone knows their rights, vis-a-vis -vis immigration enforcement, in terms of their access to school, in terms of their safety at school. But number two, we have to convince everyone never to waive their rights. And that is because we know that what goes with this campaign of rhetoric to sow confusion is the concomitant attempt to get around the limitations of detention space and immigration court space by convincing people through coercion to sign waivers of their rights to due process, to appear before an immigration judge, to make a claim for discretionary relief to which many, many undocumented immigrants are entitled. I want to emphasize we have to convince people not to waive their rights. And in doing so, we have to recognize what kind of coercion is involved when a uniformed officer is putting a piece of paper in front of you, demanding that you sign it, and it may be in a language that you don't read. This is an unprecedented attempt to embolden people to say no to that kind of immediate, in-your-face threat to their livelihoods in this country. So, the third point goes with this second. We have to convince everyone that when they exercise their rights, they will not be alone. They will be supported with resources, with community support for their families, with the kind of spiritual, emotional, and legal support that any of us would need in the face of telling a uniformed officer no, I will not sign what you have put in front of me. Now, as teachers, principals, you all know that you are on the front lines of establishing those three things for your students and their parents. And you too are not alone. Center X, UCLA, through this conference, have demonstrated their support for you. You will see throughout the day nonprofit legal organizations and others who will demonstrate their support and availability to you and your students and parents. We have to work together to establish those three things in every immigrant's mind. We've got to prepare them for what they may face. In doing so, and this I have asked in two different convenings of universities, where Plyla versus Doe doesn't apply, but we must be willing to be risk takers. The immigrant community has involuntarily been placed in a position of unprecedented risk. In support of them, we all must take on our own risk, including institutional risk. 
I emphasize this to the universities, I emphasize it here today, because there are members of my profession, lawyers, institutional lawyers. I worked for the city of Los Angeles for four years, so I was an institutional lawyer. I understand how institutional lawyers think. Their instinct is to be conservative with a small c, to defend the institutions that they represent. We all have to ask them, demand of them as their clients, that they take risk, including institutional risk in the current context that we face. Now, this is not reckless risk, because the unprecedented nature of the situation is such that there will be new law established in the next four years, new rights established in the next four years. I have told every attorney who works for me that what you thought was established law is up for question. Because the judges who established that law did so in a context assuming that every administration would act responsibly in adopting enforcement priorities, would act responsibly in respecting secure locations, would act responsibly, consistent with every administration of both parties over the last five decades, in engaging in immigration enforcement. Judges faced with a new and unexpected context will establish new rights, will establish new protections, but they will only do so if we are willing to take institutional risk to establish those rights. So I urge you all to have courage. I know you have it. You're here today. You demonstrate it every day in support of your students. But I want you to know that your courage will not go unrecognized, will not go unrewarded by courts and judges appointed by both parties who will recognize the uniqueness of this threat and stand with you in defending against it. Our constitutional values that lay behind Plyler versus Doe have not changed. As a people, the principles that bring us together have not changed. And I believe that our courts, and ultimately, I hope, our Congress will step forward to defend those but they will do so in response to the actions and demands of people like us around the country. In early January, I was at a conference of lawyers in the Bay Area, where one of my co-panelists characterized this as Trumpocalypse. Now I admit, throughout my career, I've not been known as an optimist. But even for me, Trumpocalypse, I thought, went too far. And I said so. And I said I prefer to characterize this as Hurricane Donald. <laughs> and it's an apt metaphor, because like hurricanes, this man-made, I use the gendered language advisedly, this man-made disaster, Hurricane Donald, has all of the erratic characteristics of a hurricane, has all of the changing velocity and strength of a hurricane, and it requires the preparedness and commitment of first responders. Among those first responders are certainly lawyers, but they are also teachers and principals. John used that term, first responders. But like first responders, we must stand together and we, of necessity, it goes with the role, will take risks. So I urge you as first responders to recognize your allies, to recognize the Constitution, the values and principles that stand behind you in ensuring that every child receives their Plyler versus Doe established right to an education, not just to a seat, but to an education free of the fear and anxiety that he is being consciously created by this new administration. Good luck to us all in this important first responding endeavor.